Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about the ethical code in clinical psychology and why is this important. Please turn on your captions if you have any difficulty following along and let's get started. So what is ethics? Well, this question has been debated upon for years now. Ethics is basically a set of instructions which suggest how a person ought to behave in a specific circumstance. When we generally talk about ethics, we don't associate criminal behavior with it. For example, if we raise our voice on our parents, it would be unethical but it would not be a crime. Hence, ethics is not enforced by law. However, our understanding of professional ethics dictates that if these ethical conducts are not applied in our professional lives, then there will be punishment for us because people in history have tried to do the same and ended up with disastrous results. Or we can use our inductive reasoning to understand what violation of a certain ethical principle can actually lead to. Well then, why should you be ethical? This is a long debate and one filled with literature and philosophy or rather this is a debate which has filled literature and philosophy. One must be ethical because one needs to make a conscious decision of being an agent of good in the world. If one chooses to not do the right thing, one harms the overall progress of humanity. On top of that, his own conscience feels extremely violated. That can set you off on a path towards cynicism and that's just not great. Now, a history of ethical conduct in psychology is not the brightest. The early Greeks had as much understanding of ethical issues in psychology as their understanding of psychology itself, very little. Then we had people like Pinel, Luke and Dex who tried to vouch in favor of the welfare of the mentally ill but it was not until the Nazi horrors of experimentation were uncovered that people decided to finally have a proper ethical conduct. It was proposed in 1947 and formulated by 1953 by thousands of psychologists. However, this ethical code was very vague and not enforceable. As the civil rights movement progressed, it was only in 1992 that changes were made to the ethical code that introduced actual enforceable codes and penalties for not maintaining the same. The code was revised in 2002 again and has been minorly tweaked in 2010 and 2016. This ethical code is maintained by the American Psychologist Association or APA. There are five basic principles of ethical conduct. The first one is beneficence and non-maleficence, which basically means that psychologists have to look after the welfare of the people they work with professionally, whether that be in administering tests or psychotherapy. At the same time, they have to check against their active biases against certain groups of people. Next, we have the case of fidelity and responsibility. That means that it is the duty of each psychologist to make sure these ethical codes are upheld. They are expected to warn and even report their colleagues if they feel like they are not respecting the code. They must take part in activities and dispense as much knowledge of professional ethics as possible. One can do that by acting as the mentor of some upcoming student or taking part in peer review journals. Next, we have the case of integrity. Psychologists must be transparent with their practice and not seek to manipulate the patient or their test results simply to match their expected outcomes. At times, deception is necessary in psychotherapy, whereby it must be enforced only as far as it is necessary and justified by ethical standards. This deception should not cause distress to the patient. Now, justice is all about making sure that people from different backgrounds have access to clinical help and the advantages brought by new methods. Respecting people's rights and dignity is about being courteous to the people that you work with. They may be from a different race or religion and you have to respect their beliefs. At the same time, you have to maintain the confidentiality of your patient unless you are approached by law enforcement or you are writing a research paper. Even in those cases, there are strict guidelines. There are 10 ethical standards which have been put across by the APA. The first one is resolving ethical issues, which basically means that one must adhere to the guidelines provided by APA's code of conduct when they are faced with an ethical dilemma. For example, what do you do when your patient falls in love with you? Don't make a face like that. That actually happens more than the number of times your psychologist's girlfriend would like to admit. Competence means that you have to furnish the details to the client as to what you're trained to do in therapy. It also means that in emergency situations, you're allowed to step outside your professional boundaries and do something you're not trained to do. Human relations talk about how you ought to interact with other mental health professionals. Privacy is about keeping your patient's secret a secret. You will have to talk about the details of your patient at times, but it is best to keep it at a minimum. Advertising and public statements cover the part where you divulge the details of any event as clearly as possible. You are not allowed to advertise yourself as teaching psychotherapy when you are not even a postgraduate student yet. At the same time, any public statements made must be scientifically sound and should not be rambling about the benefits of wearing crystals over a talk show. Record keeping is self-explanatory. Just keep your research and patient records preserved. That includes the details of why and what therapy was given so that other researchers can look at it as well in case uh, you decide to publish uh, it, it in journal. Education and training talks about how you should develop courses for budding mental health professionals with as much scientific accuracy as possible. Also, avoid giving psychotherapy to your own students. 
Research and publication talks about the importance of keeping with the participants and one's own institution in loop regarding any development in the study. You're not allowed to collect data which might be worrying to the participant without actually furnishing the details regarding the purpose of the study. Assessment means the administration of tests and hence a psychologist should realize the limitations of these tools and also keep the results private. The last one, which is therapy, can be very tricky. It involves what you ought to do when you are discharging psychotherapy. This is largely uncharted territory because a psychologist must always be on his toes for something wrong that can happen. And you must transfer your clients if you feel like they're getting too attached to you, for example. Of course, as I said, these codes are enforceable and like anything that is enforceable, there is due punishment for failing to follow along. If you don't follow these codes, you are likely to be suspended and have your practicing license revoked. If you have caused impairment or damage to the patient's well-being, well, you're in for a lawsuit. So be ready to shell out a large amount of cash. Finally, there are still a few ethical problems which exist in the world of clinical psychology. I'd like to remind you that APS code is a document in making and not finalized in any sense. New data keeps popping up, uh, following which these principles get amended from time to time. Right now, we have the issues of client welfare in special situations, which basically talks about challenges being faced while dispensing psychotherapy to individuals with special needs. At other times, there is vagueness about the informed consent part of the whole deal. When the patient disagrees or agrees with the treatment, does that mean that the patient agrees to follow all the treatments that follow through? What if I've agreed to a session of psychotherapy, but it has now transformed into a session of pizza eating and I have followed along out of a sense of courtesy. Similarly, we have the problems of confidentiality. What do you do when the FBI comes knocking at your door asking for details about your client who apparently is a psychotic killer? How much details are you supposed to give away? Finally, we have the case of competence. Chances are, if you have survived long enough in the world to be able to understand what I'm saying in this video, you have definitely seen people high up at the top positions where they don't belong at all. How do we make the system more robust against such unfair selection of people? These are questions which continue to haunt any clinical psychologist with dream about a professional utopia. That's all for this one guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, subscribe and comment. See you next Monday. I'm sorry for slipping up quite a lot, but you know, it's hard to put all of these words together. You understand. Take care.